Well, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to UAB um, Department of Pathology Grand Rounds. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I did want to give one final reminder to please send recommendations for both external and internal speakers to Laura Wheeler. Um, we will hopefully start finalizing the fall session um, in the coming weeks, um, which remember will also be hybrid. So looking forward to that. But with that out of the way, please join me in welcoming UAB's own Dr. Bernessa Lindemann. Um, I'm happy she accepted despite having a busy morning in the OR and that she was able to make it right on time. So perfect. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Lindemann is a native of Kentucky and completed her undergraduate training summa cum laude at the University of Louisville before completing her medical degree with Alpha Omega Alpha Honors as the Founders Medalist at Vanderbilt. From there, she headed east to complete residency training at um, Johns Hopkins in general surgery and a fellowship in endocrine surgery at the Brigham um, Women's at Harvard. Then in 2017, UAB was fortunate enough to recruit Dr. Lindemann, where she is now an associate professor of surgery and assistant dean for graduate medical education. And if that wasn't enough, she also serves as the section chief and fellowship director for endocrine surgery, the wellness champion for the department of surgery, and co-director of the multidisciplinary endocrine tumor clinic. So quite a few um, hats um, she's wearing as, in addition to the uh, nice UAB <laughs> um, one she's sporting today. Um, she has several research interests that encompass development of competency and surgical trainees, mechanisms to enhance physician and trainee well-being by focusing on the working and learning climate, and improving experiences and patients' outcomes, which I think we'll hear about some today. She has an outstanding um, over 86 publications, five already this year, great pace. And um, I could go on and on, that's only the tip of her CV, but I don't wanna take up any more of her time. And um, I will give her the floor where she will tell us about advances in management of adrenal disease. Thank you, Dr. Lindemann. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, far too lengthy <laughs> introduction. I wish that you would have cut it down, um, but uh, you all can just see how much that I tend to blush. I wanted to start off by saying truly how honored I am for the invitation to come and speak with such an esteemed group of colleagues. I have had the privilege of working with many of you. Uh, in my tenure so far at UAB, and uh, have always been impressed by the quality and depth of your work. And so my hope today was to talk about some advances in the management of adrenal disease. There may be things that, that you are actually uh, further ahead in your knowledge about uh, than, than I am. So I will beg your forgiveness for whenever there are things that I might wade into and, and I would appreciate your perspectives in return, uh, but also wanted to share sort of the, the clinical viewpoint about some of the directions the field is headed in so that we can continue to help support one another uh, in our mutual care of patients. So without further ado, uh, I'll spend some time talking about how to heal your adrenals. There's a surprising amount of information about that on the internet. If you find yourself in uh, need of a deep rabbit hole to dive into. But uh, the agenda that I have laid out is a fairly packed one. Um, and so if there are topics of more interest than others, please feel free to put this in the chat as a, an educator. I'm always trying to tailor the things that I speak to my audience's desires. So if there are things that you would rather hear about or things that aren't as interesting, then um, please let me know. I would be delighted. And also please stop me at any point in time to ask questions and I'll try to leave some time at the end as well. Okay, um, you may be familiar with this history, but uh, some authors believe that the first description of an adrenal problem or pathology uh, was actually written in the Bible that Esau, um, Jacob's brother, was exceptionally hairy and strong. So many believe that perhaps that represented congenital adrenal hyperplasia. But we know that Galen uh, in the early AD centuries described some loose flesh that was attached to what we now call the left adrenal vein. And so we think that that's really the first description of adrenal tissue. Eustasius in the 1500s described them as glandulae renibus incubentis, so glands um, near the kidneys or incubated with the kidneys, and that's how they became known as adrenal glands. Um, 
But I would say that really how we think about them these days revolves much more around this machine uh, and particularly in this setting. So in my world, I see lots and lots of people who have adrenal nodules that have primarily been identified on imaging performed for other reasons often obtained in the emergency department. And so it's really to try to figure out which ones of these need intervention. Um, because we see a lot more of these so-called adrenal incidentalomas than we do patients who present with symptoms at the outset. And so adrenal incidentalomas are identified in one to 5% of axial images performed for other indications. And you can see from my reference, that's actually a pretty old publication. It's probably the best data that we have, but there are some authors in smaller series that believe that the incidence is actually higher in the general population. And you can see that up to 10% in those older than 65. I find it interesting that there is an increased prevalence in those with obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. Um, you'll hear me talk about subclinical Cushing syndrome, all of those things are associated with subclinical Cushing syndrome. And so I think what we're, what we're seeing is when we see increased prevalence in those conditions, we're seeing people or patients with subclinical Cushing's. And we'll talk more about that. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, um, I would like for you to remember the adrenal gland should almost never be biopsied. That's sort of the soapbox that I stand upon. Um, and so in whatever ways you have to influence those that may be making decisions about biopsies, um, we should be moving away from that uh, in large part. And that's because I would put forward this algorithm for your consideration. And I think this largely holds up, I'll, I'll show you a couple different versions that uh, we review imaging, we perform a bio biochemical evaluation and divide adrenal masses into the functional group and the non-functional group. And all of the functional ones go for surgical resection. In the non-functional group, we're trying to figure out, is this a malignancy? And so those that are large uh, are resected. Those that, are ben that look benign or are small are observed. But really, um, you see my asterisk there, that CT-guided FNA should really only be performed for metastases that are not resectable. And I'll come back to this because I think this is an area where the field has really been advancing in recent years. Um, obviously, I'm a surgeon, and so I'm biased in this regard. But I hope I can convince you that the risks of surgery are relatively low particularly compared to the risks of missing a potentially um, impactful malignancy within the adrenal gland. So I kind of alluded to anytime we see an adrenal incidentaloma, there are three questions we answer. If it's functional, if it's malignant, like a primary malignancy, or if it's metastatic. And you all probably are much more aware perhaps than other groups that uh, adrenal masses are divided into those that arise from the cortex as well as the medulla. And for the cortical masses, we perform uh, biochemical workup for uh, hyperaldosteronism with the labs that are shown there, for hypercortisolism with the choose your own adventure in terms of the workup, and then for pheochromocytoma, which would not neatly fit in the bubble that I have, um, and also your choice of laboratory testing. And so this is what leads me to, you know, thinking about the questions we ask for an adrenal incidentaloma to say that we don't ever want to miss a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. And so we often think about the features of malignancy that we can see on radiologic imaging, because uh, that's often the first step. And so necrosis, calcifications, hemorrhage, size is probably the most important radiographic feature. And that if the nodule is less than four centimeters in size, there's only a 2% risk that that's a, an adrenal cancer primarily. As it increases in size and greater than four centimeters, it's a 6% risk. If it's greater than six centimeters, it's a 25% risk. And I imagine that you all know, like I do, that adrenal cortical carcinoma is one of the most aggressive malignancies in, that exists in people. And so we want to have 
very aggressive surveillance paradigms to match the aggressive behavior of the disease. And so we can see some examples on imaging for these in, in all of these uh, lesions, this left adrenal mass in the top image and the bilateral adrenal masses in the lower image um, are all highly concerning for adrenal cortical cancer. They're all greater than six centimeters in size. And so I would implore you um, and everyone that I meet, it's not just your group, that all adrenal nodules four centimeters or more in size should be referred for surgical evaluation so that we are not missing a primary adrenal cortical cancer. When it comes to imaging studies, CT is preferred. And we have historically used the following criteria that if the mass has low attenuation is less than 10 Hounsfield units, it can be very reliably said to be benign. However, if it has a higher attenuation than that, we call that an indeterminate nodule and we start to be concerned about malignancy. And on an adrenal protocol scan, then we start thinking about the ways that the lesion hangs on to the contrast medium that is administered, that malignant lesions are highly vascular and so hang on to contrast longer as compared to benign lesions. And so we've used these 60% absolute and 40% relative washout cutoffs for a long time. There's some new data, these are unpublished, used uh, with the, the um, distribution of Martin Fosnacht uh, from the Netherlands. And their data suggests that you know, often we are missing lesions that are malignant, but may not be a primary adrenal cancer. So in this example, here's this adrenal nodule on the non-contrast phase, it's 31 Hounsfield units. Contrast is administered, it goes up to 115. And then on the delayed phase, the washout is 78% absolute washout, 57% relative washout. So that meets our criteria, right? We want to see it greater than those thresholds, but this turned out to be a metastatic adrenal lesion. And that's really the gap that we're seeing. Um, and I'll show you some data that I hope convince you that, uh, that patients with oligometastatic uh, disease to their adrenal glands actually have a survival benefit from adrenalectomy and so should be considered for that therapeutic option. And so in their study, they have found that adapting the cutoff to a 58% relative washout um, provided no false positives. So we were screening everyone inappropriately, um, but only 15% uh, of benign masses with an unenhanced imaging of a Hounsfield unit less than, or I'm sorry, greater than 10 could be identified. So we may need to use both criteria um, that we look for, you know, the low attenuation lesions in addition to a relative washout of 58%. There will be more to come on that in the future, I am certain. Um, I think the new kid on the block in adrenal imaging, although it's not a new kid on the block in terms of uh, cancer imaging is PET scanning but it's beginning to be used more and more often to differentiate benign from malignant adrenal diseases, primarily to avoid biopsy. And so if we look at the adrenal lesion standard uptake value, uh, a ratio of that to the mean liver standard uptake value, you can see that um, this strategy classified these 117 lesions quite well, that it only, showed that um, seven lesions that were benign, uh, it thought that those might be concerning for malignancy and only seven malignancies out of the 47 that were included in the cohort were initially misidentified based on PET scanning. So this may ultimately uh, with further investigation turn out to be a much more reliable uh, imaging modality. If we're thinking a little bit more about primary adrenal cortical carcinoma, I wanted to share with you some information that is hot off the presses. Uh, the NSAT group um, 
and they have another sister organization in Europe that serves as their international registry system. They recently held an adrenal symposium and they presented some of these data. Um, some of them are published and some of them are not. And so I'm happy to provide you references afterward for wherever uh, there are unpublished data that are included. But they are really trying to identify markers that have prognostic significance for adrenal cortical carcinoma, particularly because that affects the adjuvant therapy that we give. And so there's an initial German cohort of 319 patients. There was an INSAT, um, which is the European Network for the Study of Adrenal Tumors. Um, they had a validation cohort. There's about a 20% crossover between these two populations just because adrenal cortical carcinoma is such a rare disease. But you can see when they do waterfall plots or Kaplan-Meier survival curves of the different groups based on their proliferation index that clearly the group with a low rate of pr proliferation um, had the highest uh, survival. This is recurrence-free survival in these graphs. And that the group with um, higher proliferation really did uh, not do as well in this group. And so people have been trying to figure out, you know, what are the other factors in addition to the KI-67 index that are predictive? And so there is this new score, the s grass for prognostication. And again, this comes from Europe. So they're using the INSAT staging rather than you know, the AJCC staging that we may favor here in the United States. But um, you can see that when you combine stage and KI-67 grading, resection status, age, and symptoms, and symptoms typically has referred in this cohort to symptoms due to hormone excess, specifically hypercortisolism, that when you put that together, the s grass score was able to provide similar to even slightly better prognostication compared to stage alone um, and certainly compared to KI-67 index alone. So I think we will continue to see that these prognostic schema are studied and refined over time, but certainly the field has come a little further than we ever have before. And the reason this is important is because it helps us to define the adjuvant therapy that is indicated. So um, in an adrenal cortical carcinoma that's amenable to complete resection, if you're able to achieve that, then you would divide the patient into groups of low risk, moderate risk, and very high risk based on their stage and their proliferation index. Um, and it's really the decision about whether or not to give adjuvant mitotane. And then in the very high risk group, whether to provide standard platinum-based chemotherapy to the group that is at most risk. And I, and I think that this schema as it stands is not very controversial. Um, this is what most clinicians follow, but I can tell you that there are a lot of gray areas within this um, because the, the weight of different factors is difficult to determine. So I recently had a patient um, that I shared uh, and appreciated the input of uh, Dr. Maggie Galusi. And, you know, the, the patient is a stage two, which, you know, makes her lower risk, but the KI-67 index is 20%. And so that puts her in a higher risk category, despite the fact that, you know, she does not have positive nodes. Um, she's young. She was not symptomatic from hormone excess. And so figuring out how to walk that balance uh, and whether adjuvant therapy would be beneficial, those are questions that we are still wrestling to answer, primarily due to the rarity of this disease. Okay, um, so I'm gonna leave primary adrenal cancer for a few minutes and move on to thinking about adrenal metastasectomy. And I hope to convince you that there is a survival benefit 
for adrenal metastasectomy. I had the privilege of participating in this multi-institutional study uh, with some colleagues of mine. And we looked at patients across our institutions that went to surgery for a secondary adrenal malignancy. So you can see the characteristics of this cohort in the table at the right side of the slide. I would point out that the most common primary tumor types, lung cancer far and away most common, followed by renal cell carcinoma and then melanoma. And that the majority of patients had metachronous lesions. So these were not metastases present at the time of initial diagnosis of their primary tumor. These came later and the majority had oligometastatic disease. So one site to a few sites of disease um, was not defined in uh, a way such as to limit the cohort of study. But it turns out putting all of these disparate individuals together that resection actually conferred a survival benefit. So disease-free survival was 54% at one year and 31% at five years in this cohort. Overall survival was 83% at one year and 43% at five years. And so even in the setting of metastatic disease, we see that similar to other disease sites, such as hepatic metastases, that patients can derive a survival benefit from resection of this disease in the carefully selected population. And so just to show you uh, some of those data, we lumped um, patients with non-lung cancer, just because they made up about 60% of the cohort, whereas lung cancer was about 40% of the cohort. And you can see that the lung cancer group did the best. And so perhaps, you know, saying that adrenal metastasectomy you know, all comers has a survival benefit might be a little premature, but I think we can certainly say that for patients with primary lung cancer, um, those are the patients driving this uh, analysis. And we can see that they do derive specifically a disease-free survival benefit. And then both groups derived some overall survival benefit. And so what I uh, am often recommending to patients and colleagues is that if we are suspicious in a patient with a known history of malignancy and we're suspicious that their adrenal lesion may represent a metastasis, we should diagnose as well as follow that with a PET CT. And the OR biopsy is only there to say that we should consider doing a biopsy if the patient doesn't have a tissue diagnosis or they would not otherwise be considered a surgical candidate. And we probably need to think about liberalizing our criteria for who are surgical candidates in light of these important survival data. Okay, I wanted to talk about some more recent developments in the field um, related to some of the hormone excess syndromes and um, specifically thinking about hyperaldosteronism. Now, this uh, sentence is directed, directed at clinicians, right? That we should be doing liberal adrenal vein sampling for hyperaldosteronism. But I wanted to touch on some of the advances related to um, the basic understanding of this disease. So I wanted to talk about uh, a case of a patient that I had. Um, this is a 45 year old male. He had a history of uh, pretty treatment resistant hypertension. He was on three different medications. He'd been hypertensive for 13 years. So started at a pretty young age. He had moved around and had been lost to follow up um, from several physicians. He was taking potassium supplements and he was otherwise asymptomatic with no real pertinent past medical history or family history. And you can see a slice of his CT scan here um, where I have circled both of his adrenal glands. And so you can see that there's a nodule definitely here on the left but the right one is a little bit more irregular than I would feel comfortable saying is normal. And that um, is 
particularly because of something I'll show you. I think it's on the next slide. But if we think about how to diagnose hyperaldosteronism, another important point I would tell you is there is nearly an epidemic of hyperaldosteronism that goes undiagnosed. And I think much of this is because um, we are taught as medical students to screen for people with an elevated blood pressure and a low potassium. Well, it turns out in these nice studies that were published recently in hypertension and in the journal of uh, clinical endocrinology and metabolism that um, the prevalence of hypokalemia in primary hyperaldosteronism if we use that as a screening criterion, we will be missing 43% of patients. So it's well over a third, close to a half of patients with hyperaldosteronism that do not have a depressed potassium. Now, if you do the reverse and just look at people with hypokalemia, that statistic is even worse. Um, because only 28% of patients with hypokalemia will have hyperaldosteronism. We do see that as you decrease the potassium level, so those with very low potassium uh, tend to have a higher prevalence of hyperaldosteronism, but there is such a spectrum of disease in this disorder that we cannot rely on the potassium um, with as much emphasis as perhaps we put on it at one point. And so as researchers often do, um, people will put together different scoring systems or algorithms for how to make this diagnosis. Um, this is the JCEM study from March of 2021. And um, they put together this scoring system Actually, I've used it a few times and it, it does tend to work out pretty well. You can see that it places an emphasis on having um, a suppressed renin, which really I would tell you is one of the hallmarks of the diagnosis, having an elevated aldosterone at the time of screening, and a lot of emphasis also on having a low potassium. But you can see that the elevated aldosterone and the low potassium are equally weighted whereas the suppressed renin is, is right next in line. And so all of those factors become important. And to me, that emphasizes the message that in patients with treatment resistant hypertension, whether or not they have low potassium, they need to be screened with a plasma renin activity and an aldosterone concentration in order to really understand uh, the spectrum of disease they may be suffering from. So the paper includes this very helpful algorithm. I apologize, I, I didn't note to you that they refer to this as the PACT score. And um, if the screening test was positive for uh, primary hyperaldosteronism, and so by that, I mean uh, an elevated aldosterone and or an elevated aldosterone renin ratio, then a packed score was calculated. And so if you were really high, then you have the diagnosis and you go on to have adrenal vein sampling, so on and so forth. If your score is equivocal somewhere in the middle range, then you go on to have confirmatory testing, oral salt loading, um, some other potential options. And then only if the confirmatory testing is positive, do you go on to adrenal vein sampling? If that is negative, then we don't send you away, but we just move you into a surveillance paradigm to make sure that we're not missing something into the future. Um, and I get pretty passionate about this, I apologize, uh, but I think that we are missing an opportunity to treat so many people because it's estimated that up to 15% of all people with hypertension have hyperaldosteronism. Just think about the people that you pass as you walk through the hallways at UAB. Think through the people that you pass when you're out in your day-to-day -day life, when you go to the grocery store or the shopping mall, if you go to the shopping mall, um, or you're out walking in your neighborhood, I'm betting that many of those patients have, or many of those people, they're not patients, 
at least not to us at that moment, but many of those people will have an elevated blood pressure. And so if you think about it, one out of every 10, one and a half out of every 10 will have hyperaldosteronism as the underlying cause and could be improved with appropriate treatment. And so that's what we have to figure out. So we used to just divide this into aldosterone producing adenoma and then idiopathic adrenal hyperplasia, but there are all these things in the middle that, you know, this was just my gestalt about this. I, I left this slide in um, because I, I thought that was interesting just to illustrate from, you know, the clinician's standpoint, those are the things that I'm thinking about. Um, but really, I, the discipline of pathology has been moving this field forward um, in quite an important way. And so this is the Histaldo uh, classification. I, I am particularly fond of that moniker. But um, really, I think probably for the first time demonstrates the true breadth of what lesions can result in a state of excess aldosterone. And so we see, you know, they range from uh, an aldosterone producing adrenal cortical carcinoma. Those are extremely rare to the aldosterone producing cortical adenoma. Those are fairly common, but in, in this example, that has to be greater than a centimeter in size. And so if it's less than a centimeter in size, it's an aldosterone producing nodule or a micro nodule. Um, and then you can also have multiple uh, aldosterone producing nodules or micro nodules, or you can have aldosterone producing diffuse hyperplasia. And you know, for my purposes as a surgeon, it has not mattered as much whether you have you know, the multiple nodules or a solitary nodule, or if you have the diffuse hyperplasia, right? I, we tend to think about it as do you lateralize to one side or not, because it tells me what I have to do in terms of adrenalectomy. But it turns out that through some uh, very, I think, well, interesting and well done studies um, that using this CYP11B2 immunohistochemistry combined with the morphologic features that we see that you can actually make uh, a diagnosis and go on to prognosticate about um, what we can expect for that patient over the long term. And so I included um, some photomicrographs of aldosterone producing nodule. And this is the CYP11B2 staining associated with that. Um, here is the multiple adrenal, I'm sorry, aldosterone producing nodules. So each of those small areas is considered sort of a micro nodule. And that's contrasted with the aldosterone producing diffuse hyperplasia, where it's a nearly continuous line of the CYP11B2 staining. And it turns out if you have that aldosterone producing diffuse hyperplasia, that those patients tend to do much better with medical management. And that's sort of what we had always known, but um, it's, you know, I think it's nice to see the science come behind and support the schema that we have been using and provide a rationale for why we do the things that we do. And so, um, I think the other thing is it, uh, it prognosticates about whether or not the patient's going to lateralize to one side or not. And in the surgical community, we spend lots of time debating about whether or not to perform adrenal vein sampling. Now I will disclose my bias that I am a pro adrenal vein sampling surgeon. That's because I think uh, this diagram is also old. It's from 2014 in the journal hypertension, but I think it just really highlights the important questions that our patients have to ask, right? So is the patient seeking a long-term cure of their hypertension and or their hypokalemia with adrenalectomy? If they don't, if they don't want to be cured, then fine. Like then you're not going to do anything. So definitely don't do adrenal vein sampling. If they do want a cure, which most people do, then you figure out is an adrenalectomy indicated or are they a candidate for it? Um, if they're, if, surgery is out of the question, 
then you know AVS is not necessary. But if uh, surgery is indicated and they're a good candidate, then that's this is the key question. Do they accept a 20 to 50% chance of having the wrong adrenal removed? And for a long time, as the studies were just coming out about adrenal vein sampling, people were perplexed that you would see an adenoma on one side and have, I usually quote people a 25 to 30% risk, but it depends on, you know, which range of studies that you want to include uh, as, you know, where you set your bounds. Um, but people were perplexed that you could have, you know, what looked like an adrenal adenoma probably is an adrenal adenoma on one side, but then when you perform vein sampling and biochemically evaluate the blood draining out of those adrenal glands, you could have one that looks structurally normal or that, you know, maybe contains a four millimeter nodule that is actually the source of the excess aldosterone. And so um, I think it is just wonderfully elegant that we now can see with the staining, this diffuse hyperplasia along the boundaries in adrenal hyperplasia versus these multiple little micro nodules or a true aldosterone producing adenoma. Um, I, I look forward to where our field is gonna go following this. I'm happy to skip this, but I thought I might bore you for just a minute talking about, you know, how we conceptualize adrenal vein sampling. Um, it's something that I spend lots of time talking to my trainees about because it's something that's quite confusing because it requires multiple steps to interpret. Um, it is a technically demanding procedure. It's not one that I do. I rely on my colleagues from interventional radiology. And we are very fortunate that we have experts in this procedure here at UAB, but even with that, uh, the procedure does have uh, probably a five to 10% failure rate. And so you have to be able to interpret this to understand whether the procedure was performed correctly. So the first thing is, is it selective? And, and so we measure cortisol in addition to aldosterone, right? We're expecting the aldosterone to be abnormal, at least on one side, but potentially on both. And so we use the cortisol as a control and we want to see that the cortisol levels in the adrenal veins are two to three times the cortisol level in the inferior vena cava. And so if we see here, um, the left adrenal vein checks out, it's about a ratio of four and the right adrenal vein had a pretty high cortisol. Um, and so that, that ratio is also pretty high. It's like 26 or something. So it's only after you determine that the adrenal veins were selected, right? That we actually, the radiologist actually got the catheter into that tiny little one centimeter in length vein that we can say um, that we can make any inferences at all about whether the levels of aldosterone are elevated or not. Because if we can't be confident that the catheter wasn't sampling from the right spot, then our analysis is doomed from the beginning. So it's at this point that we calculate an aldosterone to cortisol ratio. And so you can see that in the left adrenal vein, that ratio is 8.67. In the right adrenal vein, it's not even one. And so um, here at UAB, we don't utilize ACTH stimulation. There are pros and cons on both sides. Actually, the most recent data indicate that um, using uh, ACTH stimulation can actually lead to some false positives on the adrenal vein sampling, but this patient very clearly localized to the left and underwent a left minimally invasive adrenalectomy at the two month mark postoperatively. They were weaning off their last antihypertensive agent. This is the 45 year old male that I described. So they had almost immediately been able to stop two they were down to one and they were decreasing the dose and their potassium had normalized, which to me was very much a victory. But to many patients, they may come in saying, well, I want to get off all of my medication. Isn't this a surgically curable form of hypertension? And that is a true statement, but there are some patients that will achieve a full clinical cure 
but the majority of patients will receive only or achieve only a partial clinical cure. And so this um, PASO study group, uh, they published their findings in, in 2017. And so they found that um, in terms of biochemical success, 94% of patients, I'm jumping ahead, 94% of patients achieved a biochemical success, but only 37% achieved complete clinical success where they came off all of their blood pressure medications. And the majority, 47%, had a partial clinical success where they were able to wean off of one medication or maybe two, but they weren't able to stop entirely. And that's due to a lot of the autoregulatory function um, as well uh, of our circulatory system, as well as arteriosclerosis, that once hypertension gets started, the arteries get used to a certain pressure head and um, build up a more muscular wall, and they're unable to relax. Uh, going forward in the future. I'm going to take a breath and make sure and check the chat. I don't see anything in it at present. Um, so I'll keep going and talk a little bit more about subclinical Cushing syndrome. And uh, the second case this is a 58 year old woman that was referred to me for an adrenal nodule that was found on a, a CT that was performed for abdominal pain. So again, an incidentaloma. She had uh, weight gain. She's had much worse diabetes. Her blood sugar has been really high. Uh, her hypertension has gotten worse. She's had to add on a, a second agent. Her exam really is not remarkable except for obesity. And so many people would look at this and say, okay, that person just has metabolic syndrome. And yes, this person has metabolic syndrome, but they also have an adrenal nodule. And so biochemical workup was performed. Potassium was normal, renin's normal, aldosterone is normal, metanephrines are normal. The cortisol, this is a dexamethasone suppression test. And so um, over the last several years, the field has shifted into thinking about hypercortisolism as a binary diagnosis of your cortisol is normal or it's abnormal and you have Cushing syndrome. There's a gray zone of people in the middle. And so I'll, I'll show you um, this diagram first and then I'll go on to tell you the things that are at the left that you can already see. But on the gold standard screening test, which is a one milligram dexamethasone suppression test, the people whose cortisol level is less than 1.8, those people are normal. They do not have cortisol excess. The people whose cortisol is greater than five would be classified as overt Cushing syndrome, right? The things that we all think about, the moon facies, the buffalo hump, the purple stria, the truncal obesity, proximal muscle weakness, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the people that develop those symptoms. But the people in the middle, it turns out, have an association with metabolic syndrome hypertension, diabetes, obesity, low bone density, hypertriglyceridemia. And studies over the last several years have shown that it actually does not progress to overt Cushing's. So I believe, and I, there are early data to support that a lot of the metabolic syndrome that we see in people walking around is really subclinical Cushing syndrome. And the question is, how can we impact the facets of the metabolic syndrome the best? Is it possible to do some sort of adrenal intervention? Is it the adrenal as the source of potential cortisol excess that's driving this? And so unlike Cushing's syndrome, that really is centered upon an elevated cortisol alone and you figure out if it's ACTH dependent or independent, subclinical Cushing's usually starts with a, a mass. And so you find a mass and then you do a biochemical evaluation and then you identify cortisol excess. But these patients don't have signs or symptoms of overt Cushing syndrome. And so they, they don't come to a diagnosis in that way. They come because they have metabolic syndrome.
And so um, I wanted to differentiate that, you know, after in the subclinical Cushing's group, those patients are obligated to undergo confirmatory testing. And then if they have cortisol excess associated comorbidities, then it's that group that we should consider for surgery. Everybody gets follow-up, but if they have comorbidities, then we should think about taking out the adrenal gland. And I'll show you why. This is from a review article. Um, this just shows truly the lack of concordance between guidelines from different important organizations. And, and this is changing my own specialty society. These guidelines were from 2009. And so subclinical Cushing's wasn't even a thing back then. Um, and so these guidelines are being updated this year in 2022, um, but people are all over the place and the tests that are recommended are all over the place. So this is an area where we need some synthesis to come together. But the one thing that is very, very clear is that um, in these five studies that um, we're mostly retrospective, but there's one randomized prospective trial here in the, the second row down. We see that comparing adrenalectomy to medical management, we see that only the surgical group had an improvement in uh, weight, in blood pressure, in impaired glucose regulation, and in dyslipidemia. There also, they didn't include it in this table, but the surgical group also had an improvement in bone mineral density. Whereas the medical management group had very little improvement overall. And so again, I would say that um, the people that derive benefit then are the people that have these comorbidities from metabolic syndrome. You see them listed on the slide. I feel like I have said them ad nauseum, so I, I won't review again. And I thank you for the question in the chat. You know, do we check the function of the pituitary and hypothalamus too in subclinical Cushing syndrome? And yes, I absolutely do. Um, and that's because cortisol levels can fluctuate throughout the day. Um, and many of our testing schema, they don't do as well in, you know, patients that work overnight, right? Many of our overnight nursing staff, um, they would fail cortisol testing if we just did that outright and didn't inquire further about their work history or habits. And so it's really important to make sure that you're not missing an overt Cushing syndrome. So typically it's the initial screening test. It's a confirmatory test to, to prove again on a different metric that um, the cortisol excess is there. And then we typically would get an ACTH to go along with it. Thank you for the question. And then, um, I wanted to, I, I feel like I can't give a talk without uh, talking somewhat about surgery. Um, and I, I would say a couple of points. One is that most of these are performed minimally invasively. I'm not going to belabor this, um, but just to show that our adrenal glands are not located in a convenient spot. They're way at our back behind the pancreas and the spleen right next to the IVC. And they are highly vascular, which you're well aware of. Um, the two common minimally invasive approaches are transabdominal, sort of going along the costal margin, and then a retroperitoneal approach, uh, utilizing the space between the um, bottom of the 12th rib and the top of the iliac crest. And they both have advantages and disadvantages, the transabdominal being much more familiar to surgeons that are used to operating in the abdomen. Um, and other access to other organs and structures, but you have to move things out of the way. Um, if the person's had surgery in the past, then there's scar tissue you have to contend with. The retroperitoneal approach is less familiar. It's a tighter working space, but it's much more direct access. You don't have to move anything out of the way. Um, and you can perform a bilateral adrenalectomy without repositioning. You can avoid scar tissue from prior operations. Um, there have been many studies that compare these two approaches. This is the topic of much conversation at surgical meetings, I assure you. In order to be most efficient in use of our time, I've decided to create this little table. So in this randomized trial, um, this one showed that overall recovery favored uh, RP adrenalectomy 
but not in terms of these individual outcomes. Um, in this retrospective study, blood loss and hospital length of stay favored RP adrenalectomy. In this retrospective review, RP adrenalectomy for a few other variables. In this retrospective study, they found um, you know, equivocal results with some uh, factors favoring laparoscopic transabdominal adrenalectomy. This randomized controlled trial found no difference. Um, this systematic review put together the studies that had been done were, was favoring uh, RP adrenalectomy. And I think probably because much of their results were influenced by this randomized controlled trial that is my favorite surgical study of all time to have been performed. So I hope you will um, give me liberty in explaining it just a little bit because I, I feel as though, uh, and I have myself have wrestled with, you know, well, we, it's impossible to do randomized controlled trials in surgery, especially those that are blinded. Uh, but this surgeon did it. And so um, there's a total of 65 patients. So it was a small sample, but there was one surgeon. So the surgeon variable was controlled and they learned both approaches within one calendar year. And the surgeon was the only person that, and the people in the operating room, only people that knew what procedure the patient had. When they finished, they put on a big bandage that covered all of the potential operative sites. I think this is ingenious. And they kept the bandage on for three days and they didn't take it down. So the patient didn't know, the nurses didn't know, nobody knew. And so they looked at all sorts of different operative outcomes, um, length of surgery, blood loss, percent that were converted to an open operation, post-operative pain um, of different varieties. But you can see that in all of these, except for conversion, where there was no difference, the, the data favored the retroperitoneoscopic adrenalectomy. In other outcomes, so time to oral intake, hospital length of stay, surgical complications, um, and then they graded surgical complications, um, as well as cost, you can see that where there was a difference, it always favored retroperitoneoscopic adrenalectomy. So timed oral intake was less, hospital length of stay was less, complications were the same, uh, or at least there was no significant difference, and that was true across categories. And then the cost of the operation was less, probably because uh, there was a shorter duration of the procedure. Apologies, I didn't click through my boxes as I said it. And so what I would tell you then, uh, and what we have been working on here at UAB, along with two other centers in the United States, so trying to really be at the cutting edge, um, pardon my pun, is pushing the envelope to do adrenal surgery on an outpatient basis. And I think that the pandemic has hastened other centers in thinking about this as well, but we're fortunate that we have become a leader and have contributed to the literature in this domain. And so this study was published, I think it was published in 2020. Um, this is a combination of data from UAB as well as uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. And so we had uh, about 200 patients in total. Almost half of them had adrenalectomy on an outpatient basis. Now, this is not a randomized study. Uh, and so, you know, there was patient selection involved. And if the case went late into the night, probably the patient stayed overnight, et cetera, et cetera. But importantly, this study was the first to demonstrate that outpatient adrenalectomy was not associated with increased readmission rate, nor was it associated with increased complications. Um, and so you can see that actually in our model, the only covariate that was statistically significant was that outpatient adrenalectomy was associated with a lower odds ratio for complications again, in this non-randomized sample, probably because the sicker people had to stay overnight. A follow-up study that I didn't want to take too much time to go over, but our group followed or published as a, a follow-up using just our patients at UAB, we assessed patient satisfaction. And it turns out that, um, you know, the only difference that we see is that the outpatient group were more likely to say that they were offered adrenalectomy on an outpatient basis. Um, but otherwise, there were no differences between the groups. And levels of patient satisfaction were very high across both groups. And so patients that have outpatient adrenal surgery are a highly motivated and highly satisfied group of individuals.
So bottom line are that adrenal surgery is safe. Uh, can be effectively performed on an outpatient basis, even for functional tumors. That includes pheochromocytoma. They're sent home less often on the you know, same day of surgery, but we do that in selected individuals that um, can thrive in an outpatient setting. I tell people it's a similar recovery to that of having your gallbladder taken out, but we need to remain vigilant to ensure that we're not ever missing a primary adrenal cortical cancer. Um, we want to make sure that we're offering this beneficial therapy of adrenalectomy for patients with metastatic adrenal lesions, and that we are trying to think more carefully about um, which patients might benefit from adrenalectomy in subclinical Cushing syndrome and screening for it more often. Okay, I hope that I have not given you adrenal fatigue throughout our time together, but I put up my contact information. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Um, and again, thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, so I wait for anybody to uh, uh, unmute or turn on their camera. I, I did have one question. Going back to some of the prediction models, I think you do a great job of showing some of their successes, um, particularly in the first part of the talk where a lot of it was driven by that German cohort and the European cohort. How translatable is that to say the Birmingham population and are these prediction tools as useful for higher risk groups, et cetera? Yeah, I, you know, as in so many things, the Europeans have the advantage of their ability to create national registries or international registries for that matter. Um, we can extrapolate that the populations in, in many ways are similar. And so I think the basic biology of the disease we believe is similar, um, but we are certainly further behind in trying to amass these types of data, just given the rarity of these tumors mm -hmm. and the large size of our nation um, mm -hmm. where, you know, a busy center for adrenal cortical carcinoma sees maybe, you know, five to 10 a year. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> quite a bit different than diabetes, which is what I'm interested in, where they can do the stratifications quite, quite nicely. Yes. Are there, but great work. Um, are there any other questions for Dr. Lindemann? I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you, uh, Vanessa. It was wonderful. Your your teaching style is just amazing. I hope our residents realize how wonderful it is to hear someone that knows so much, but then you explain different ways and uh, and and um, give your perspective and in a in such a clear and uh, and. Uh, um, comprehensive way. It was, it was just a, a delight to listen to you. Thank you so much. Uh, you're very kind. I can't turn that part of my brain off. So <laughs> thank you for your, your oh, grace. You're a wonderful uh, teacher. Yes, wonderful. Well, as a non-clinician, I'll definitely second that you'd make it very accessible, the information very accessible to yeah. even those not trained in medicine. Well, thank you. Okay. Eason, did you have a, I, I see you turned on your camera just to wave goodbye. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you again. We're at the end of the hour. I'm glad you made it right on time. And uh, hopefully your afternoon's calmer than your morning was. <laughs> Indeed. Well, thank um, you again. Thank you. Yeah. Have a Bye. great day. Okay. Hope to see y'all next week. So with the... Oh.